Welcome to a very special first time ever live episode of Blockstars, Ripple's podcast that features leaders and developers in crypto and blockchain to discuss the latest trends, technologies, and the real world problems being solved. I'm your host, Ripple CTO, David Schwartz. Today, we're broadcasting directly from the XRPL Zone stage in Seoul, South Korea with the CTO of Axelar, Yorgos Vlachos, who plays a pivotal role in transforming how blockchains communicate and collaborate across the industry. Together, we'll explore the intricate world of blockchain interoperability and the cutting edge solutions Axelar brings to the table. Thank you for joining me today here at XRPL's own Seoul and from all corners of the globe. Let's dive into an engaging discussion about the future of blockchain interoperability and the innovative strides being made by Axelar. Tell us a little bit more about what you do and what Axelar does. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, my third time in Seoul in the last year. We're going to be doing so much together that I'm very excited to spend time with the community here. Uh, my background, I mean, I've been in the space for about seven, eight years. Um, at this point, uh, I did my degrees at MIT together with my co-founder and we were part of the three-person founding team for the Algorand blockchain where we built one of the first proof-of-stake blockchains in the space. And uh, long story short, once we launched Algorand, we realized that uh, it was an island. It was very hard to onboard users from any other chain. And we recognized that many other blockchain projects in the space are going to have the same problem. So about four, four and a half years ago, we decided to solve this problem, not just for Algorand, for the wider ecosystem and connect all blockchains. Would you say interoperability is like, is your company's focus? That's, yeah, that's the sole thing. One thing and do it well. So why do you think interoperability is important? Many reasons. Um, well, first of all, the space is completely unusable without interoperability. Right? Just to make an analogy with the traditional um, you know, financial system, imagine you know, I have my bank account in Bank of America and you're a vendor, you, know, you have a city bank account and you know, imagine if my, my credit card couldn't pay in your bank account and transfer funds. Right? We wouldn't be able to, to do anything or everything would be centralized in one institution, you wouldn't have a free market competition, right? it would be a very bad situation. And in Web3, we have a similar situation where for a very long time, blockchains have been islands, you know, you have an asset like XRP, one of the biggest assets in the space, and it's still not available in DeFi, right? The holders cannot put it to productive use, and it really limits what people can do with those assets, right? So interoperability, is innovative not because it's going to invent new use cases. The innovative use cases are going to be built on your ecosystem, on the XRPL ledger, and some of the other blockchains in the space. But interoperability really makes blockchain usable, right, and accessible to all users. So uh, it's not about novel use cases, but it's about making the existing use cases uh, easy to use. So, so what are the components of an interoperability solution? I'd say there's a few different ways to design an interoperability solution, but the most popular approach have been one where you have some entity that passes messages and assets from one chain to another. Right? And historically, I think the first interoperability solutions were centralized exchanges, right? Like Binance, where they have a big company that casts these assets on behalf of users. You give them assets on one chain, you do a swap in their platform, they give you assets on the other chain. And uh, the next evolution of that was, of course, all of the centralized prison solutions that you know, have been getting hacked over multiple years, billions of dollars being lost. And uh, you know, with Axelar, we took like, a fundamentally different approach, where we're like, we don't want to have one person in the middle that's just passing assets back and forth between chains. Instead, we're going to have a blockchain that's decentralized and going to have similar security guarantees as existing blockchains. Right? So you cannot just, you know, if you're a North Korea hacker, you cannot target one individual and steal the whole funds, you would have to compromise dozens of different validators that are geographically distributed and independent organizations. So it's the idea that you build a blockchain that's specifically designed to be an interoperability blockchain, then you just connect it to all of the blockchains that you want to be able to interoperate with each other? Exactly. So it's kind of like the uptain thesis, if you think about it. You know, every blockchain can specialize in one thing. Uh, I think of like, uh, you know, even XRPL ledger, I mean, it's going to be general purpose, but it's going to have a, a very big focus on RWAs, right? And it makes sense to specialize. For Axelar, the specialty is interoperability. And uh, just to take a step back and explain why we need a blockchain, if you look at all of the previous solutions that got hacked for billions of dollars in total, effectively what they did is that they would typically have the core team or a founder that was holding all of the funds in you know, some ledger or God knows where they held the funds. 
it would work well for one, two, three years, mm -hmm. and then eventually they got compromised, someone got access to the key, and would steal all of those funds, right? So how do we decentralize this process? Well, the only way we know how to decentralize uh, an entity is by launching a blockchain, right? So we launch a blockchain, it has like crypto economic security like all the other blockchains, and it today has a decentralized validator set of 75 validators and growing. But that was the main thing. We want to decentralization and the best way to get decentralization is by launching a blockchain. But blockchains don't usually keep secrets, right? Like the Bitcoin blockchain can't keep a secret. The XRPL, XRPL can't keep a secret because you need to be able to somehow sign transactions to release other currencies. Somehow you have to keep a secret somewhere. That's right. So it's the validators, right? On every blockchain, the validators shares are secret, right? So effectively, when you do a cross-chain transaction through Acceler, the validators have to collectively sign a cross-chain operation and approve the transaction. And unless you can attack, corrupt the majority of the validators, you will not be able to, to fabricate a cross-chain operation. So what's a typical validator quorum look like? Roughly? It's, uh, yeah. it's stake, stake weighted, so maybe today it's like 40 out of the 75 um, validators, and we're looking to decentralize more and more over time. But uh, just to give you a sense, I think the next closest competitor, which is Wormhole, has uh, you know, 19 validators. It's fully permissioned, and you need to compromise 12 of them, so like four times less uh, distributed. And then there's like some others, like you know, uh, Layer Zero, uh, some of the ones that got hacked as well, that you know, have a very small number of validators. And often you don't even know. It's like three, four validators, and that's it. Are the validators anonymous, or are they known or is it up to them whether they want to disclose identity or not? I mean, for the majority, uh, there's no transparency in most cross-chain solutions. So like, you know, I, I, we don't really know, but for Acceler, it's fully transparent set. And, it's, and uh, it's exactly the same model as uh, other blockchains, right? So um, if you look at most of the proof of stake blockchains in the space, the validator set is, is usually known, right? These are usually like big entities that are trusted for validating a network. But of course, you can run a node anonymously as well, right? So it's a combination of mostly known operators and a bunch of unknown ones. And I'd say the distribution of nodes is very similar to some of the other big chains, right? So uh, which is good because you want to replicate the level of security of the chains we connect, right? We cannot be more secure than the chains we connect because if a chain breaks, things can go wrong. So we want to replicate the same level of security. Right. So, for example, if there was a double spend on Bitcoin, you have to be careful that you don't bridge a transaction that Bitcoin later decides didn't happen. Exactly. And that's why we also like how the validators fully validate uh, its individual chain. And uh, that's something else that's actually quite interesting uh, with Axelar because we have a blockchain. It operates in a hub and spoke architecture. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, effectively, uh, you can build custom connections from any chain to Axelar. And you can decide how you want to secure that connection, right? So, um, you know, with XRPL, because uh, with, not with the EVM, but with the uh, original XRP ledger, we have to build a very custom integration, right? But once we build this bridge between XRPL and Axelar, and we can pass some information between XRPL and Axelar, we can forward to any other chain like Solana, Ethereum, and so on. So, this scales very well. This scales very easily because with one simple integration, uh, you can get access to the whole ecosystem. But the other thing you can do is that if one chain breaks, you can cut off the connection mm -hmm. there. While with virtually every, every other bridging solution in the space, they operate in a pairwise manner. So if a chain happens to break, the damage can contaminate to every other chain. So maybe there's like a $10 double spend on a chain, but then you can steal like thousands of dollars on every other chain. And like, you know, it scales by the number of connections. It can be pretty bad. What does the user experience using the bridge look like? Uh, it's improving over time. So today, what you can do, um, there's multiple bridges built on top of Axelar. So Axelar itself, it's just a messaging layer that passes messages across different chains. And on top of that layer, people can build cross-chain applications like bridges. Right? The most popular bridge on uh, Axelar is uh, Squid, which is also going to be launching on XRPL. And what it allows to do is Start with any asset on any chain. Let's say you hold some Sol on Solana, and with one transaction from your wallet, you should be able to receive uh, the XRP token or any other token on XRPL. Under the hood, there's many transactions that happen in between. There's a swap on the origin chain, typically. A bridging transaction, you bridge some stable coin, you swap again, but all that is abstracted away from the user, right? So you can compose these sophisticated sequences of cross-chain interactions and abstract them away so the user only sees the 
you know, the initial transaction and the end result, and the whole flow can take like 10 to 20 seconds, and we're actively improving the time as well. That's awesome. So what is Axar going to do for the EVM sidechain? So first of all, we're going to connect it. Uh, You're going to provide a bridge, I would hope. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, you know, I don't think we're going to enable like any, you know, novel use cases. It's more about enabling these big asset issuers like Open it, and, you know, we have a very close relationship uh, with them. Uh, incredible team. And, uh, you know, we're going to enable them to con to link their instance of like their stablecoin that's going to launch on XRPL with the instance of their stablecoin on, on Ethereum, right? So a holder of the asset can bridge it over to XRPL EVM with zero slip ups, right? So you can, you can do these interesting things where if you work closely with the issuer of the asset, you can allow them to move the asset uh, without friction uh, across chains. But the one thing I'm most excited about happening on XRPL is finally opening up DeFi opportunities for, um, you know, for XRP, right? Again, it's the biggest asset with one of the biggest communities that doesn't have DeFi, right? And being able to use this asset productively uh, in DeFi, I think it's going to be a big thing. And then XRPL, you know, Ripple obviously has a very unique edge when it comes to RWAs. And with Acceler, we're working with most of the RWA issuers as well. So it's not something we've, I think we've done a deep dive yet with, with your team, but uh, it's something we're prioritizing now and just bringing new RWAs over to XRPL. And uh, I think you guys have a big edge there and we can make it probably the biggest chain, right, for, for RWA um, adoption. So I think there's some interesting directions there. So you kind of already answered the next question, which is what would you foresee as the evolution of the EVM sidechain? So I assume real world asset tokenization is probably uh, big. Yeah, and I'm sure you have other plans, right, to make it like a general purpose chain and like have all kinds of applications, but like, I don't know, to me, it just makes sense to focus on one thing and do it really well. Obviously, like uh, a lot of people across the globe use Ripple for remittances. So it's, again, a natural evolution to just have all kinds of assets. Uh, myself, personally, I use a lot of these RWA issuers, and there's not too many of them, right? I think until last year, we didn't even have tokenized treasuries on chain. But now if you know how to use crypto, it's very easy to just get access to like, you know, like treasury yields, which you have to go through hoops, like they're not even available in a lot of parts of the world, right? So bringing those assets over, yeah, I think it's going to be super interesting. So tell us a little more about where you see Axelar going. What is Axelar going to be developing and as this industry changes? So Axelar itself, I don't think we're going to change what we're doing, at least for the foreseeable future. Just better. <laughs> Just better, right? Or more Faster, secure. cheaper. Uh, and, and wider coverage. So uh, we have this big uh, launch. Again, let's call it an Axelar V2, where we're launching smart contracts on top of Axelar. And then chains will be able to even launch their own contracts on Axelar and connect their chain. So it's going to be fully permissionless to connect the chain, single point of integration, and then you get access to like, you know, uh, 60 plus chains we have today and hopefully like hundreds by, by next year. Um, so it's becoming like more and more of a developer platform. But effectively, like, I strongly believe that, you know, when you're launching, when you're working on interoperability, we've seen so many things go wrong in the past, right? And I, I was kind of like, you know, disappointed personally to see so many builders just taking shortcuts, launching, launching their own centralized bridges fast. This is yeah. so against the ethos of the space, right? Yeah. It's like, but it's, it's hard. It's hard to do it right. And it's very easy. It, it's much cheaper and easier to say that you're secure than to actually be secure. And very few people look too closely. And it, it's just hard to build, right? It took us more than two years just to initially launch Axelar and with a very limited feature set. We've been building for like four and a half years. At this point, and I understand why a lot of people are like, oh, okay, we're going to launch something centralized and then we're going to decentralize later. But I think everyone underestimates how hard it is to build decentralized Absolutely. infrastructure. And I mean, to this point, like two and a half years later, after Axelar launched, there's not a single other decentralized interoperability layer in the space, right? Everyone is still describing how they're going to decentralize later. But, you know, we're still the only one, right? And I think it's because from day one, we understood it's going to be a hard problem and we understood there's going to be like eventually trillions of dollars at stake, right? And like, you know, like Ripple, we do a lot of work with financial institutions. And as we talk to those folks, they're like, yeah, but can we trust your technology, right? Because there's all these hacks and if we want to put trillions of dollars on this technology, like we can't, we can't take any risks, right? So it's hindering adoptions, even for us that have done things the right way. 
it's very hard sometimes to convince serious players that you know this technology is secure just because of all these problems. So a lot of work to be done still. It was quite a challenge for us doing due diligence around the various different companies that pitched us, you know, ways to build an EVM sidechain. And of course, everybody swore that it would be decentralized. Everybody swore that it would be secure. And it did take, you know, quite a bit of digging to make sure that we actually got, you know, the right solutions in place to have something that would stand the test of time. Even with us, I don't know if you remember the first call we had. It was like three years ago. It was a very heated discussion, a lot of back and forth. And that's when I knew, like, you know, you, you really cared about the product and you really cared about security and took a while to convince your team. But I think, you know, at this point you've done your diligence and uh, I'm very, very happy that yeah, we're definitely, this we definitely had people say like, you really know what questions to ask. Like, you know where the bodies would be buried if bodies were buried. And uh, yeah, it took us a while, but I think, I think we, found the right, we found the right partners. So I love to torture my guests. I always do this. Um, I always ask the crystal ball question. So where do you see, it could be your company, it could be yourself, it could be the industry. Just give us a prediction two years from now. Two years. I think that's easy, honestly, for Axelar. We're just going to be connecting all chains, right? Our goal is to have, you know, we have robust security right now, like for the core set of chains we've integrated. Uh, we want to have the widest coverage, right? And with our architecture, it's relatively easy to expand to all of the non-EVM chains. That's how we're gonna be adding like the XRP ledger, the original ledger. Uh, we're gonna be expanding to some of the other chains like Ton, uh, Solana, Sui. We wanna have complete coverage. And our strategy is simple, right? Like the EVM space is very congested right now. Like there's so much competition even from centralized players, but <laughs> interoperability is a network effects business, right? And we can talk to people all day about security, but the average developer, honestly, like, is going to pick the solution that's easiest for them to use. So we need to have another edge, right? And the edge is going to be coverage. Once we have all chains, I just don't see an issue picking another solution because you can pick a solution that just works on the EVMs, and then you will have to work with us regardless. You're not going to have composability with the other ecosystems if you don't. So might as well just use Axelar for, for everything, right? So it's a simple strategy. We're still going to be focused 100% on the security of the solution. We're gonna, not going to be launching other products. We're not going to be pivoting, right? It's interoperability is a full-time job. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll see. We'll see in two years. Uh, I mean, hopefully we'll have XRPL as the biggest RWA chain. I think, you know, I think that's a safe prediction. Let's see what happens. But uh, yeah, we'll see in two years. Well, I certainly hope you're right. Thank you, Yurgos, for joining me today. It was a pleasure hosting you on Blockstars. Don't be a stranger. Thank you so much, and always a pleasure to talk to the community here. A huge thank you to you, our listeners, as always, for tuning in. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me on Twitter at Joel Katz, J-O-E-L-K-A-T-Z. And remember to follow at RippleXDev on Twitter to keep up with the latest industry news, technical updates, and cool new developer projects from the community. See you around the blockchain. Thank you.